The poem that I'm about to perform I wrote a few years ago. Um, hadn't thought about it in a while, but I think lately with both the shooting in Milwaukee over the weekend and um, or in the past few days and um, just generally where we are right now in our country, I've been thinking a lot about what it means to be a patriot, what it means to cling to the ideals of a nation, even when those ideals are killing people. Um, so this poem is called Arms. After Philando Castile's murderer was acquitted of all charges, I thought a lot about how he told the officer he was licensed to carry a handgun, about the calm in his voice, how he sounded like he'd rehearsed this a dozen times that morning just in case. And I think about how I rehearsed this poem a dozen times this morning just in case, and I thought a lot about the Second Amendment, how it doesn't quite seem to apply to everyone how a black man with a gun is a threat, but a white man with a gun is a patriot, or how a black child playing with a toy gun in a park is a thug, but a white man with an AK-47 strapped, strapped to his belt in a grocery store is a patriot, or how a black woman firing a warning shot at her abuser is a danger to society, but a white man with a gun showing up to the memorial of a victim of police brutality is a patriot, or how a black child with some Skittles is one of those assholes that always gets away. But a white man with a gun following a 17-year-old around in his gated community is still a patriot, still has the right to stand his ground. And I think we too often forget that Trayvon Martin wasn't killed by the police, just by a white man with a gun on neighborhood watch who fancied himself God for the evening, thought he'd decide who lived and who died that day. And I find it fascinating how the right to bear arms comes second only to free speech, but is 11 amendments above outlawing slavery, and I wonder when we got our priorities so out of order. Wonder how many bullets and bodies and street corner memorials it will take before we wake up. And as I sat at home on the 4th of July and listened to the sound of fireworks go on for hours, I wondered to myself, when did America fall so in love with the sound of gunshots that she wanted to hear them on her birthday? <laughs> So I know we're in San Francisco, but I'm from Oakland, and I can't help but rep Oakland everywhere I go. Um, how many people in this room are familiar with Barbecue Becky? Yeah. Okay, that's a sizable amount. Um, for those of you who aren't, uh, a few years ago, a video went viral of a white woman um, by Lake Merritt in Oakland who approached a black man who was barbecuing by the lake and told him that he wasn't allowed to barbecue there. Um, and when he told her that he in fact was, she called the police, and when the police arrived and asked her why they had been called for a man that was barbecuing, she began crying and claiming that he was harassing her. Um, video went viral, she was dubbed Barbecue Becky. Uh, this poem is for her. For Jennifer Schulte, better known as Barbecue Becky. 1930s America, the second black migration brings a large population of black folk from the south to California. Suburbanization, redlining, and white flight leave Oakland almost entirely black 2012. Oakland is named the third most dangerous city in the nation and the most dangerous city in California. The reports fail to mention that among all of these corpses is the soul of a city that produces far more than just gunfire. Fail to mention the 400,000 hearts beating as one. Fail to mention one of the most unique places in the world. Instead, paint a picture of a graveyard drowning in its own blood. I go to a summer camp with kids from all across the nation, and every single one of them looks at me with horror when I say my city's name, Backtrack, to January 2009. An Oscar Grant is killed by BART police while standing on a platform with five friends, and we are again reminded that we are not safe, even cradled in our mother's arms, even cradled in our city's arms, even in our own bodies. Fast forward a few years, and all five of Oscar's friends who were on that platform are dead due to gun violence, and now. It is May of 2018, and I watch from my phone screen as a white woman tries to 911 call a black body into ghosts where he stands, knowing how a badge and a gun will protect her from the consequence of her own tongue knowing how a siren will strike familiar fear into black heart and calls not in spite of, but because of this. Knowing 
that these streets are too used to swallowing our bones into the pavement, knowing that these gutters are fiends for black blood and calls upon what she believes to be the blue angel of death to feed the lake yet another black corpse and still. There will be more to take after the funeral and she knows this too. White tears stream out her eyes like an offering to the crows. Temptation before she calls out the feeding cry, yells out harassment like the wolf who cried sheep because she knew the rest of the pack was right behind her waiting. Closed her eyes and waited for the vultures to come. Had the nerve to call it her park. Her lake had the audacity to claim a city she didn't know, had the audacity to look at her reflection in the water and think that this was all that was there. To think there was nothing further than herself. And I watch as my lake opens its jaws and devours her, teaches her what is just beyond the surface ripples of her lake and three weeks of black protests fill the air with barbecue smoke and music and twisting, dancing bodies that are just trying to forget the feeling of being othered in their own home. I wonder if Jennifer ever read about Carolyn Dunham, the white woman that lied about a black boy's whistle till Emmett Till was broken, beaten, and drowned. I wonder if Jennifer thought Carolyn something of a hero. I wonder if Jennifer thought herself something of a hero following in the footsteps of her foremothers. I wonder if Jennifer knows how many black men my city lays to rest every year. I wonder if she finally felt like the fulfillment of a legacy. She finally felt like a part of my city. Um, so for this last poem, I was thinking a lot about what, you know, with this, the theme of this being the soul of a nation, what it means to be from somewhere. Um, and my parents are Ethiopian immigrants and I often grapple with, with how I'm both not wanted here and not really from here, but I'm not from anywhere else. Um, and so this poem, this poem kind of deals with that. Plane takeoff, 11.15 a.m., Washington, D.C., Dulles Airport. 5,000 feet above the ground, steadily climbing, I think about the idea of flight. How poetic to defy gravity, to be so close to heaven that you can almost grasp it. How beautiful as a concept when it isn't ripping people apart. How 500 miles per hour above the clouds is the only way I'm allowed to see my family flying always. Maybe that's why I've always loved planes. Corny movies on low quality screens and Bruno Mars playing through a tinny pair of free earbuds, how a foreign country or an airplane is the only place I can sleep in front of strangers. And I think about how birds only fly so far when they migrate or escape the cold, as though we are coming here to stay or perhaps to flee. And I find it fascinating how I am most at home in the sky, both everywhere and nowhere all at once between my home and the home of my ancestors' purgatory. How this midpoint is where I belong, how I am an argument between the clouds. We cheat death, chase time, and dance through time zones as if to say, I dare you to take an hour away from me. Only we could have figured out a way to outrun the sun. I look at my mother slowly relax as she grows nearer to her mother and remember that for the immigrant, Homeland is a process delayed. Remember that I am what I will abandon once again. Remember who I am and who I am born of. I feel my grandmother's blood course through my veins and realize that my strength is nothing compared to the woman that raised my mother. Feel generations of women in my family with fire in their eyes and feel that fire in my own soul. Everything I know about courage, I learn from my mother who refuse to acknowledge fear and brave the world without question. Everything I know about resilience, I learned from the woman who raised eight children alone in a country that did not want to allow her to do it, to think that this sky is the only thing left between my grandmother and I. To think that this sky thought it could survive being the only thing between my grandmother and I. To think that this sky thought it could survive my grandmother and I. We turn cartwheels through the sky and dare to call ourselves immortal. Dare to call this migration a homecoming and not a departure. Dare 
to call this migration a repentance and not a repetition of our sins dare to be here in the sky, smiling with all our bones and daring to come home. Thank you guys so much for having me.